Oh, hey, Adrian, can I have a cherry? They're like my favorite. Oh, yeah. Where'd you get those? <laughs> this is a George Dog's High Mile, and this bit is going to get everything monetized. The Pillarman. In about 100,000 BC, Cars is born. He's a member of a subterranean species we call the Pillarmen. They're super powerful, but exposure to sunlight completely destroys them. Classic vampire sh**. 10,000 years later, Cars boy ACDC shows up, and the two of them eventually decide that living forever isn't enough. They need to take over the whole planet too, apparently. Now, there wasn't much about 10,000 years ago, so I'm not sure what they would have conquered. Still, those prehistoric humans sure must have been afraid. While this is happening, a mysterious meteorite lands in Greenland, about 50,000 BC. Eventually, Cars creates the Stone Mask, a tool to make the Pillar Man strong enough to withstand sunlight. A Pillar Man immune to sunlight is basically a perfect being, at least if you like absurdly muscly dudes. But there's a problem. The mask is incomplete and can only turn normal humans into vampires. The other Pillarmen fear Cars' plan and attack him, so he and ACDC kill all of them, aside from the infants Wamu and Santana, because that's what you do when you have a disagreement with someone. Before Cars and the gang can complete the stone mask, they've got some house cleaning to do. Around 50 BC, the remaining Pillarmen wipe out what they believe is the last of the Ripple Clan. Members of the Ripple Clan can basically channel sunlight through their punches, so they're a huge threat to the Pillarmen, because sunlight and vampires. With their biggest enemy gone, the Pillar Men take a nice little nap in the Colosseum for close to 2,000 years. I mean, they slept through some minor events like the fall of the Roman Empire, the Black Plague, and the colonization of their birthplace, the Americas. Minor events. Even though the Pillar Men are napping, their stone mask makes its mark on history. In the 12th century, the Aztecs used the stone mask to become the dominant group in ancient Mexico. For some unknown reason, the Aztecs and the stone mask disappeared. My guess is they all got caught up in the sun. The stone mask wouldn't appear for another few hundred years. Part one, Phantom Blood. In 1867, Dio Brando is born, and Jonathan Joestar comes a year later. Shortly after the young Joestar's birth, his parents purchase an ancient Aztec artifact, the stone mask. They don't know about its power, they just want something cool to hang on their wall. Because why have a portrait on your wall when you can have an ancient relic that makes people vampires? Let's go to Ikea. On a trip, the Joe Stars get caught in a horrific carriage accident. Jonathan and his father, George, survive, but Mary Joe Star isn't so lucky. Dale's father, Dario Brando, is there, ready to loot the wreckage. But when George wakes up, Dario tricks him into believing that he saved them. George's good nature unfortunately means Dario gets to use him as a literal get out of jail card. Life for the Joe Stars stays pretty normal for a while. In 1873, George buys Jonathan the sweetest dog you'll ever find in the franchise, Danny. Don't get too attached to Danny. Or any dog in this series. Seven years later, the Joe Star family gets another member. When Dario finally dies, George still feels a great sense of gratitude. So he makes the biggest mistake of anyone's life and adopts Dio into the family. Dio makes Jonathan's life a living hell. He pretty much assaults Jonathan's would-be girlfriend, Erina, stealing her first kiss. It was me, Dio. <laughs> he even throws Danny into an incinerator. I told you. This is only the first in a long line of dog deaths by Rocky's hands. There's being a cat person, and then there's killing every dog who's ever in your series. Over the next seven years, Dio cools off and makes nice with Jonathan, earning his trust. But it was all a lie. See, George has been sick, and Jonathan learns that the golden boy, Dio, plans on poisoning him to get the Joe Star fortune. Just like he did to his father, Dario. In case you don't remember the name. Jonathan leaves his father to find some trusted doctors and sets off to find an antidote. Meanwhile, Deal learns that the stone mask isn't a torture device, but a vampire making device. And so he starts plotting to use it against Jonathan. By the time Deal makes it back to the Joe Star estate, Jonathan is already waiting for him. He's got some of the antidote, some cops, and proof of Dio's treachery. Oh, and he also has his new buddy, Robert E.O. Speedwagon. Best waifu in the series, don't at me, at Kurichi YT. At this point, any more schemes from Dio would be useless. I can't do it, like, cause how do you say the words fast? Let's pretend I did it right. Desperate, Dio tries to stab Jonathan, but George jumps in his way, sacrificing himself. 
Just then, Dio dons the mask, becomes a vampire, and escapes the police. Jonathan battles Dio, but beating a vampire is kinda tough. So as a last resort, Jonathan decides to just burn his whole mansion down. Nevertheless, Dio escapes with the mask while Jonathan meets up with Erina again. To defeat Dio, Jonathan begins learning Hamon from Will Antonio Zeppeli, a master of Hamon devoted to destroying the stone mask. Sorry, Pillar Man, looks like you missed some of the Hamon clan. Speedwagon joins the gang too, even though he's very afraid. Once they reach the town Dio's hold up in, he sicks a pair of 300-year-old knights on him and dips. With the power of Hamon, Jonathan successfully defeats one of the knights, but runs into trouble with the second one. The heroic man he is, Zeppeli sacrifices himself as Roundabout begins to play. Look, just search it up. It's all over YouTube. It's a great scene. I cry every time. I love you, Zeppeli. They soon reach Dio's castle, but Jonathan gets separated from the others. Dio freezes Jojo's blood. Since could when vampires do that? That seems a little unfair. Luckily, Jonathan uses some nearby fire to thaw himself free and use Hamon to defeat Dio. At least he would have if the vampire didn't survive by cutting his own head off. Speedwagon destroys the stone mask and he and Jonathan leave, confident that Dio's been destroyed. He's not. But of course, things don't work out that easily. In 1889, Joseph and Erina get married and they waste no time continuing the Joestar bloodline. And it's a good thing too, because less than a week later, Dio's head crashes their honeymoon cruise to America with the purpose of taking Jonathan's body for himself, since you know, he's kind of lacking one right now. Some shit goes down and Jonathan destroys the ship to keep Dio at bay. Erna escapes with a baby girl named Elizabeth that she rescues from the ship. And Jonathan dies cradling Dio's head. It's good to know that Dio is now totally vanquished, never to return. He's never coming back. Jumping ahead to 1910, Speedwagon strikes oil in America, gets rich, and founds the very humbly named Speedwagon Foundation. The foundation follows the same progressive ethos as others of the time, focusing on medicine, the environment, and helping the Joestar family in their never-ending fight against those who wish to misuse the powers of the past. Exactly what Upton Sinclair would have wanted. Part two, battle tendency. Eight years later, in 1918, Will's grandson Caesar, Antonio Zeppeli, is born, and Joseph Joe Star's birth follows two years later. Dio's last remaining zombie kills Jonathan's son and Joseph's father, George Joe Star II. In return, his wife Elizabeth takes revenge and destroys the zombie. Yes, this is the same Elizabeth that Erina saved from the boat. The Speedwagon Foundation helps Elizabeth disappear, and she takes on the name of Lisa Lisa. Without a husband, Erina raises Joseph all by herself. In 1933, the Nazis take power and discover the Pillar Men in Rome. Look, part two has some real Indiana Jones vibes. You had to expect some Nazis. I don't know why Mussolini let them poke around like that. Uh, fascists aren't that smart. By this point, young Joseph saves Speedwagon from being kidnapped, while Caesar is a poor, abandoned delinquent, easily winning his fights with his partially awakened form of homo. Two years later, Caesar's father sacrifices himself to save him from the Pillar Men. So the teen trains under Lisa Lisa in order to get revenge on the prehistoric species. In 1938, Santana, one of the younger Pillar Men, is found waking up in Mexico, left behind by his buddies. Speedwagon shows up to see what's going on, but a homo user that helped his buddy Jonathan fight Dio way back in the day named Straitso attacks him and uses a stone mask to become a vampire. What a dead. They knew each other defeat literally somebody that could destroy the world and he's like actually Aha! Shortly afterwards, Joseph and Erina move to New York where they learn about Speedwagon's supposed death. Suddenly, Straitso attacks Joseph. Wait, how did he get all the way to New York from Mexico so fast? It's 1938, there aren't exactly quick consumer flights yet. Along with freezing people, is fast travel another power that they had that we just didn't know in the lore? Anyway, Straitso claims he dumped Speedwagon's body into a river to avoid waking Santana up, but Speedwagon's still alive. Does anyone in JoJo's double check if their victims are dead? This is like the third time. Regardless, Joseph kicks Straitso's ass. What a stupid idea. Straitso was like, I'm gonna kill you now, so I'll be fine. Like, dude, he's like the hardest guy. You gotta stay away and train, idiot. From there, he travels to Mexico to deal with the Santana situation. For some reason, a group of Nazis are also in Mexico. I guess they slipped under the radar. The leader of the group, Rudolf von Stroheim, my boy. <laughs> if you didn't watch the anime in public video, I like him, which definitely does not sound good now that I'm saying it out loud. <laughs> I don't like him for his morals. <laughs> He's a, like a fun character, as fun as a Nazi character can be. I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna continue with the timeline. Oh, I'm gonna get canceled. The leader of the group, Rudolf von Stroheim, has taken a very not dead speed wagon, as well as Santana, prisoner. But of course, the Pillarman breaks out and proceeds to slaughter a bunch of Nazis. Yeah, 
You go, dude. So Joseph puts aside his hatred of Nazis to fight him. It's a tough fight, but Stroheim sacrifices himself, attacking Santana using a grenade strapped to his chest. With Santana injured, Joseph exposes him to sunlight and finally destroys him. But Joseph can't rest yet. He leaves for Rome where the other pillar men are beginning to awaken as well. By 1939, Joseph meets Caesar Zeppoli in Rome. At first, they hate each other, but they reluctantly team up to fight the Pillar Men. Unfortunately, the Pillar Men, Wamu, gives them a brutal beatdown after going all, Awaken my masters! Yet, Wamu admires Joseph and Caesar's potential as warriors. So he spares Jojo and Caesar, giving them a month to train and attempt a rematch. And to prevent him from running, Wamu and ACDC implant rings on Joseph's organs. The rings will kill him in a month's time if he doesn't take down the Pillar Men. So to get stronger, Joseph and Caesar train with Lisa Lisa. After they conquer the brutal Hellclimb pillar, they spend the next three weeks progressing at lightning pace. Along the way, Lisa Lisa tells them of Kars' role and deals atrocities as the creator of the stone mask. She also shows them the red stone of Asia, the jewel Kars needs to perfect the stone mask and truly become the ultimate life form. Much like Shao the Hedgehog, but with a lot less hair and a lot more being a giant man. Unfortunately, ACDC discovers the stone, killing one of Lisa Lisa's attendants and mailing it off to Kars before he's defeated by the combined strength of Joseph and Caesar. Now, best of bros. Also, why are, I never thought in media, I'd see a vampire mailing anything. The party leaves to retrieve the stone from their newest adversary, a foreign mailing system, and end up meeting a newly cybernetic Stroheim. Cars chases them, narrowly losing the stone to Joseph and allowing him to live for a while longer. Caesar leaves on his own for what's obviously a trap, though Joseph follows. Shockingly, it is a trap, and he's forced into a fight with Wamu, which he loses. At least he retrieves the antidote for Joseph before he dies. Never fun to see a bro to sacrifice himself for another bro. Let's pour one out of 3M Super 77 multi-purpose adhesive for my boy Caesar. It's the only thing that was here. Distraught but more driven than ever, Joseph and Lisa Lisa take on Wamu and Cars in one-on-one -on -one combat. Joseph defeats Wamu in what has to be the most metal chariot race of all time, but Cars tricks Lisa Lisa and unleashes vampire slaves on Joseph. Suddenly, the Nazis in Speedwagon return, distracting the vampires while Joseph goes to save Lisa Lisa. Oh, and turns out that Lisa Lisa is Joseph's mother, which makes the whole Peeping Tom scene that much weirder. And it also kicks off a long and honored tradition of creeping on hot moms in JoJo's. Anyways, once his mom's safe, Joseph uses Hamon in an attempt to defeat Cars. But using the Redstone of Asia, Cars upgrades himself into Super Shadow. I mean, I mean the ultimate life form. Don't worry though, Joseph has a plan. Flying away on a plane, Joseph tricks Cars into falling into a volcano, which does nothing at all. <laughs> Cars pops back up and severs Joseph's right arm, and yet Joseph blocks Cars' final attack with the Redstone of Asia, causing his power to backfire and the volcano to erupt. The two get launched into the sky, but before Cars can fly away, Joseph's arm flies in and grabs Cars, and so Cars gets pummeled by volcanic rock until he leaves the atmosphere, forced to float in space as an immortal forever. Remember this all happened because the carriage crashed in 1868. Joseph somehow survives, crashes his own funeral, and marries Lisa Lisa's assistant. Assistant, Susie Q. All is now right with the world. I mean, the Nazis are still in power, but that ends eventually. In 1952, Speedwagon passes away, and in 1971, Jotaro Kujo, Joseph's grandson, is born. In 1983, Joseph's illegitimate son, Josuke Higashikata, is born in Japan. That same year, Dio awakens, now using Jonathan's body and spelling his name with capital letters. Yoshikage Kira murders his first victim, and only a few years later, Dio's son, Giorno Giovanna, is born. Diablo forms Pachon after discovering arrows made of that 50,000-year-old meteorite and selling all but one of them to Dio's assistant, Enya. What happened to Hamon, you ask? Don't worry about it, because we're going to use stands now. Part 3, Stardust Crusaders. It's 1988, already an entire century after part one. This is where we're gonna have to move quicker. Part three is pretty straightforward, kind of like a monster of the week show, but with stand users. So if I skip your favorite stand user, don't get all Dio on me, all right? In July, Joseph's friend Muhammad Avdal meets Dio in Egypt. A month later, Japanese teen Kakuin encounters him and gets brainwashed. Jotaro's stand, Star Platinum, shortly reveals itself, at which point Joseph and Avdal leave for Japan to recruit him to stop Dio. By late November, Jotaro's mother, Holly, develops a stand as well, but she's unable to control it. It'll kill her unless Dio is defeated. After Jotaro fights a brainwashed Kakuin, he adds him to the squad. I mean, anything to get closer to Jotaro's mom, right Kakuin? And so the Stardust Crusaders leave in search of Dio. In Hong Kong, they defeat and unbrainwash a Frenchman named Polnareff, and he joins their party. 
Is unbrainwashed a word? I feel like it should be a word. Along the way, the group faces Dio Stan users. I won't mention everyone, you can't turn around without hearing about the work of an enemy stand. In India, Polnareff encounters Jay Guile, the man who murdered his sister and sent him on his journey in the first place. Unfortunately, he is accompanied by Whole Horse, whose stand is literally just a gun with homing bullets. Anyways, Abdal seems to die in the fight against the two, an unfortunate loss avenged by Polnareff, who kills Jay Guile. Whole Horse runs away like the coward he is. You can't use the Joestar family secret technique. After more harrowing stand battles, the group arrives in Pakistan, ever closer to their target of Egypt. Dio's assistant, Enya, mother of Jay Gao, deceives them into staying at her fake hotel. Majuro sees through her scheme in time to defeat her. Before long, Dio betrays her so that she won't spill his secrets. Talk about a bad boss. Through trials and tribulations, they continue on to Arabia, where they meet Abdal. He faked his death so that he could safely arrange the gang's trip to Egypt. Let's be real though, Araki just decided to bring him back. From sources I heard, he got tired of drawing him and decided to kill him. So, yikes. Using a submarine, they attempt to sneak into the country, which doesn't work. Like always, their vehicle is attacked by an enemy stand user. I don't know why they didn't expect this. With Jotaro's power, however, it's no big deal, and they reach Egypt at long last. Once there, Dio senses their presence and assembles his strongest followers, like Darby and the Oingo Boingo brothers. To give the team some support, the Speedwagon Foundation delivers a sixth member for the party, Iggy, a vicious dog with a stand who packs a lot of power into his small frame. Wait, a dog? Uh-oh. Iggy discovers the way to Dio's mansion. He defeats the mansion's bodyguard, Pet Shop, but loses his left paw in the process. At least the way is clear for the Crusaders. Within the mansion, they score up against Vanilla Ice, a stand user and vampire follower of Dio's. Polnareff defeats him, but only thanks to the sacrifice of Abdal and Iggy. Because there's two of them. After Dio reveals his time-stopping stand, Zawado! The battle moves outside. Just before Dio kills him, Kakuin successfully deduces Dio's power and reveals it to his allies. Joseph is injured and knocked unconscious, and Jotaro is the only one left to face Dio. After a few knives and a steamroller, Jotaro's star platinum learns to stop time as well. After some back and forth, Jotaro gets the upper hand and knocks Dio all the way down a street. But uh-oh, turns out he lands right next to Joseph, whose bloody sucks to help him reach his true form, which in the process seemingly kills off our part two protag. What are you doing? He's a, a real protagonist. He had to do a real pour out. But, he, but I, it, I'm, I'm sorry. It's With this newfound ability, Jotaro finally defeats the vampire at long last, fulfilling his great great grandfather's legacy. Using Dio's blood, Jotaro revives Joseph. So I just poured that out for nothing. And with Polnareff, they mourn the loss of their comrades before going their own ways. During the years after Dio's defeat, Jotaro and Polnareff search for the remaining arrows. In 1996, a young man named Kishibe Rohan becomes a professional manga artist. Three years later, in 1999, the arrow appears in a Japanese town named Morio, causing stand users to begin awakening in the area. How are these events related? Well, you're about to find out. Part 4. Diamond is Unbreakable. So a lot happens in part four, but only some of it is important to the main plot. There's everything from an alien to a weird cat plant thing. There's a ton of side characters and there's a lot of wacky adventures. But for the sake of brevity, I'm only gonna cover the main events around the stand arrows. In April, Jotaro arrives in Morio, or as others like to call it, a beautiful duang. The Jojo of the hour, Josuke Higashikata, his Stan, Crazy Diamond, and his friend, Koichi Hirose, are brought into a new generation of Stan-based conflicts. Unfortunately, the peaceful town of Morio also has what might be the highest ratio of serial killers in the world. Josuke's grandfather is murdered, further cementing the kind-hearted, delinquent Joestar's warrior destiny. No. No. After getting revenge on his Gramps killer by fusing him into a rock, Josuke learns about the stand creating arrow. His new mission is to track it down and prevent more death at its hands. This puts him up against the Nijimura brothers. They're using the arrows in hopes of creating someone who can kill their deformed father and put him out of his misery. After an intense fight using his bad company, Keicho Nijimura is killed by yet another criminal who wants control of the arrow. Just in case, want to. The younger brother, Okiyasu, allies himself with Josuke, and they're quickly the best of buds. Meanwhile, after getting hit with the arrow, Koichi's own stand power awakens. With his new stand, Echoes, he becomes a full-fledged member of the crew. After a long search, they find the man who killed Okiyasu's brother and defeat him before he can hinder Joseph's arrival in Morio. Josuke finally meets Joseph, but he's super cold towards him. And who can blame him? Joseph abandoned his mom. At least he treats the invisible baby he finds on the side of a road somewhat better. 
A few days later in May, Koichi meets the manga artist Kishibe Rohan. He's got a stand which can turn people or objects into books and then read or write facts about them. After Rohan uses his stand Heaven's Door on him, Koichi has to get his friend's help to defeat him the next day. Seems like Koichi's getting caught in a lot of this stuff. He's like the Polnareff of part four. Anyway, even though he can't stand Josuke, Rohan becomes friends with Koichi and becomes a valuable ally, even though he never uses Heaven's Door as effectively as he probably could. In June, the characters meet a middle schooler named Shigechi, a somewhat bratty boy who comes to idolize Josuke Josuke and Okuyasu. Before too long, however, Shigechi accidentally finds the secret possession of one Yoshikage Kira, a woman's severed hand. It's just one of the many that Kira's taken. He's obsessed with women's hands. Like, I don't kink shame, but maybe not, you know, do the hand thing and kill people. Probably like, a little weird. He can't let his secret slip, so Kira uses his stand, Killer Queen, to utterly obliterate Shigechi. Yep, I think we have our main villain for part four. Did we already pour one out for the weird looking kid? Ah, he didn't deserve one. The crew investigates Kira's house, but unfortunately, Morio actually has two arrows. The ghost of Kira's father manages to escape with one of them and creates new users to protect his son. Already a better father than Joseph. In death. Kira's close to being caught, so to protect his identity, he just gets a new one. On July 1st, he takes the place of an unassuming and honestly really bad husband, body snatcher style. His new wife is happy with the change, but the son, Hayato, knows something is up. Once again, Josuke and the gang are close to catching Kira. Hayato catches Kira in the act, and Kira kills him impulsively. He instantly regrets killing Hayato. His death makes it harder to keep a lid on the whole hand-obsessed serial killer thing. So, out of desperation, the Kira develops a new ability bites the dust. I get it. Yeah, I get it? Because it's like the song. The new ability allows Kira to start a time loop. The loop restarts if Hayato tells anyone about Kira's real identity. And on top of that, anyone who learns about Kira is instantly killed by Bites the Dust. After a few time loops that leave various Joe Bros dead in the process, shout out to my boy Rohan, Okuyasu dies, Joe Taro dies. Everyone dies, all of them die. Hayato forces Kira to admit to the murders himself. Bites the Dust is diffused and the real battle begins. So everyone's alive now, undo. After some back and forth, Kira is totally beaten down, but still willing to fight. Unfortunately for him, an ambulance accidentally runs him over. From there, he finds himself in an alley which sucks you into the land of the dead. The ghost of his first victim finally has her revenge. I told you part four was weird. The case in Morio is solved, so Joseph and Jotaro leave the town in Josuke's capable hands. All is peaceful, or at least it will be until someone insults Josuke's hair again. Oh wait, pour one out for the hand guy. Part five, Golden Wind. Two years later in 2001, rumors begin spreading about the boss of the major Neapolitan gang, Pachon. Apparently he's got a daughter, so some of the more ambitious gang members start searching for her. She'd be good leverage to overthrow the boss and run Pachon. A few months later, Giorno Giovanna attempts to make his way into Pachon so that he can lead it. He, Giorno Giovanna, has a dream. With that kind of power, he can carry out his childhood embedded dream of keeping drugs away from children. He'd basically be like a mobster dare officer with a stand. Yep, we went from a low level delinquent like Josuke to an aspiring mob boss. After encountering Bruno Bucciarati, a low level leader in Passion, Giorno proves he doesn't have the taste of a liar and the two form an alliance. Together, they'll take down Passion's boss. At the same time, he meets Koichi, who's been sent by Jotaro to investigate him. Koichi proves essential in completing the test that Giorno must pass to officially join Passion. In short, even though Araki totally forgets how strong gold experience was at this point, everything works out. At the end of March, Giorno is introduced to the rest of the Bucciarati group, Mista, Abakio, Fugo, and Narancia. Immediately, they're given a colossal task, protect the boss's daughter, Trish. Of course, it's an opportunity Giorno and Bucciarati plan to use for their eventual coup. On April Fool's Day, the Bucciarati squad kill Formaggio, the first of a group of stand users that they encounter on their journey. With names like risotto, prosciutto, and sorbet, you can make a full course meal with them. As goofy as their names are, they put up a good fight as the party attempts to travel from Naples to Rome. After defeating most of risotto's group, the crew encounters the boss for the first time. He deals a fatal blow to Bucciarati Bucciarati, but in a Jojo-like twist, only kills his body and escapes. Like a little dead, like so it's like yank. The Bucciarati squad, minus Fugo, the dirty coward, decides to follow the boss, officially becoming traitors. Woo! That night, in a terrifying plane ride, seriously, why do Jojo's characters keep getting on planes? It never works out. Trish awakens her own stand ability, which she names Spice Girl, because it's 
fitting. Wait, does she have a crush on her own stand? The boss is revealed to be Diavolo and his other personality, Dopio. He manages to squeak out a win against Risotto, the sole survivor on his team. Unfortunately, the win sets the boss up to kill Abakio. This one hurts because his stand was really cool. When the rest of the squad reaches Rome, they battle Seko and Chocolate, who I'm pretty sure are in some sort of BDSM relationship. But again, no judgment, unless you're killing people and taking their hands. Well, they're killing people, so maybe, all right, it's cool, whatever, moving on. They reveal that Bucciarati is basically a corpse living on borrowed time. Wait, didn't we do a video on best moms? Bucciarati wasn't in it, Bucciarati is best mom. We didn't know back then. Unacceptable, I quit. I'm not quitting. The Joe Bros pull through and make it to the Coliseum where they meet up with Ponoref. My boy. This is why I love JoJo, y'all. Ponoref has brought the arrow with him. He dies soon after they meet up, but not before his now upgraded stand switches around people's souls into various bodies. The final battle begins the next day and Dopio, Narancia, and Bucciarati all bite the dust. Boom, boom, boom. But when Giorno used the arrow on his own stand, Gold Experience's power is upgraded enough to be able to defeat Diavolo. And believe it or not, all of that happens over the course of a week. Giorno, Mista, and Polnareff, whose souls is now inside a turtle, because JoJo's, become the leaders of the Passion organization, and they all live happily ever after. For now. Please play that music so I don't look stupid doing this. Yeah. Honestly, I don't think the JoJo's timeline will ever be finished. Uh, Arak is a vampire, he doesn't age, and I think he's just gonna keep doing this until the end of time. And despite the massive amounts of dead dogs, I am down for all of it. That sounds bad. I'm Kurt, thanks for watching in the robot, your anime explainer, and if you like this video, subscribe. Also, we have merch now, check out the little Carousel down below. We have merch. Do that also. Help us eat.